When it comes to building a gaming PC, there is loads of great hardware that you should absolutely consider for your next PC build. Be it one of the awesome value CPUs or GPUs on the market right now, or a case like this one which I actually really like. But as much as there are plenty of great options out there, there's also a lot of hardware that you should avoid buying and be wary of when assembling your next system. And today, I'm going to walk you through the 10 types of PC components that you shouldn't buy, and give you some general pointers when it comes to avoiding mistakes with part selection in your next build. Let's do this. Take your audio up a level with the NZXT Relay High Fidelity Audio Ecosystem. Whether it's the impressive 80 watt relay speakers for great desktop audio, or the relay subwoofer that adds that much welcome bass kick, Relay lets you elevate your audio game. What's more, their switch mix with built-in DAC allows easy control over your audio, and you can switch audio outputs easily by just picking up the Relay headset one that features DTX Headphone X for 3D spatial sound. Check out our review of the Relay in the cards now or buy one for yourself at the first link below. I'm gonna do my best to give good general advice in this video and also still point out specific SKUs I would avoid and why. And you can use the timestamps below to skip through my recommendations. Now the first set of PC components you should avoid are overpriced 1080p GPUs. And there is perhaps no worse culprit of that right now than the RTX 4060 Ti. Now it is generally true that there's no such thing as a bad GPU, just a GPU that's priced badly. Now for that reason, if Nvidia chose to drop the price of this 4060 Ti down, say 50 or even $100, my feelings on it would most certainly change. And it isn't just Nvidia at this 1080p segment that are guilty of creating poor value propositions for gamers. Between the RX 7600 from AMD, the standard 4060 from Nvidia and 4060 Ti in particular, these are three cards you absolutely should be wary of. Now while while they do provide better rasterization performance than their previous gen counterparts, the main issue comes with video memory. Now at 1080p, 8GB of VRAM is enough for now, but as we head into the future, it's unlikely that this amount is going to be sufficient. This issue is compounded further when you look at some of the last gen options still available, be that AMD's RX 6700 range or Nvidia's 12GB RTX 3060. Both of these provide a compelling alternative to the existing new next gen options at the 1080p segment. Heck, if you're building on a budget at that 1080p area, I would employ you to look at some used GPUs too. You'd be surprised how cheap you can find the likes of RTX 3070s and RX 6800s on the second-hand used market. Now on the theme of GPUs, and in at number two on my recommendation, is my final piece of GPU buying advice for this video, and it all revolves around Intel Arc. Now, I really respect what Intel are doing with Arc, and I'm really relieved that they finally decided to enter the GPU segment. Truth is, we need more competition, especially, like my last point, at 1080p, and that is what Arc provides. But you shouldn't buy it, at least not yet. This is the RK750, and while it provides promise in plenty of titles, it's simply outstripped far too often by competitor options like AMD's RX 6600. The biggest problem with Arc actually comes on a game-by-game -game optimization basis. Now, what I mean by this is in some titles, Arc's pretty good and holds its own, even beats out its AMD and Nvidia rivals at the same price point. In some titles, it's terrible and the consistency is the biggest problem. You could cherry pick data to make Arc look amazing or equally cherry pick data to make it look completely crap. In reality, it's slightly below average. And while this might sound slightly scathing, the good news is these things are being fixed all the time. Game devs and Intel are working super hard, but that doesn't mean you should buy it, at least not just yet. Sorry, Intel. Now, in at number three on my list of things that you shouldn't buy right now, this one might seem a weird one. It's high-end, non-X3D Ryzen 7000 CPUs. Now, what I mean by that is chips like the Ryzen 9 7900X and 7950X, AMD's higher priced Ryzen processors right now. The reason is that the X3D chips, which build on the amazing success of Ryzen 7000 in general, provide far better gaming performance. Now, I hear what you're saying, James, I'm not really bothered about gaming. Why wouldn't I buy a Ryzen 9 7900X? It all comes down to Ryzen 9000. Now, AMD recently announced their update to Ryzen 7000 with 9000. For those wondering what happened with 8000, it was more of an APU and laptop thing. We won't go into too much detail. And the good news is that Ryzen 9000 CPUs will be compatible with existing X670 motherboards. So if you've already bought a motherboard, don't worry. And they're expected to provide up to 16% IPC improvement. That means with the same core counts and same clock speeds, you should get 16% more power. And who doesn't want more power? 
Ryzen 7000 CPU prices are only likely to fall and they really haven't dropped far enough yet for me to recommend these over Ryzen 9000. Now to be clear, Ryzen 9000 may end up being underwhelming when we actually test it in the benchmarks. But until that point, I'd urge you to wait just a few weeks for those Ryzen 9000 chips to drop or at least the reviews to become live so you can see where it stands. In at number four is all about memory. And I don't necessarily again mean this specific kit. And what I'm talking about here is RAM with a high CAS latency. Now, when it comes to memory, there's a few key things to note. You've got the generation, so DDR2, 3, 4, and 5. 2 and 3 are long gone now. 4 and 5 are the current generations on the market. You've also got the speed, often measured in megahertz or mega transfers. This kit is about 6,000, which is good. And you've also got whether or not the memory's dual channel. Is there two dims? If there is, that's great because it gives you double the bandwidth. The one key metric though you do need to consider is CAS latency. Now while DDR5 is a lot, lot quicker and has a lot more bandwidth, the CAS latencies, at least when the generation first landed, were very high. And there's still a lot of high CL kits lingering in the market. You found a 32 gigabyte kit for a bargain basement price, check the CAS latency. Ideally you want to be at 36, preferably less, closer towards that CL30 mark. CAS latency basically defines the latency for the CPU to access the memory. It's all good and well, the memory being very fast, but if it takes a while to read and write data to the memory, you're losing a lot of the advantage of that high speed. Again, this is a gaming thing more than anything else, but that's primarily what we do around here. So avoid high CAS latency memory, please. You could end up in a situation with a high CL DDR5 kit that actually performs worse than a low CL, much cheaper DDR4 kit. Something to bear in mind. In at number five is cases with bad airflow. And that's why I wanted to grab this this MSI's latest Pano P100 to talk about that. Now, one danger you get with these fish tank dual chamber cases is that the amount of glass can impede airflow. Now, this case actually does a pretty good job given the three fans on the side, which pull in air from the rear and the copious amounts of ventilation on the top and the bottom with plenty of clearance for that air to flow through too. But not all cases are quite this good on the airflow front. And increasingly, if you're building with these fish tank style dual chamber cases, you'll need to stuff in more fans than what you otherwise would with a traditional ATX mid-tower. You see, a traditional mid-tower case has three fans at the front, blowing air all the way through and one in exhaust. Naturally, these side-mounted fans are less efficient when it comes to bringing that air in in a direction that's usable. Lots of the air is being blown against the glass rather than towards key components like the CPU and GPU. Going for a case with bad airflow has lots of consequences. It isn't just that the case is noisy and the PC runs hot air, but these things have major side effects for your system. The first is that you can actually reduce the lifespan of the component. Components. If they're running hotter all the time, that isn't a good thing. The bigger issue though in the short term is what we call thermal throttling. Now, this is most prominently seen when it comes to CPUs more than anything else. The CPU wants to run at the fastest speed it possibly can, but the only thing that's stopping it doing so is the temperature it's running at. When Intel's 14th gen first landed, and even still to be honest, to this day, the biggest problem is that it's so hard to hit the advertised boost clock speeds. That's because the chip just doesn't run cool enough, even with large, massive, 420 mm AIOs, your temperatures are too high to see that top level performance. I recently put together a video recommending the best CPU coolers for different budgets and CPUs, and you can find that in the card section now and linked down below. The main thing really is make sure you've got a case with proportional airflow. It's good to keep your components cool. The more fans and the more airflow, the quieter and generally better performing your build is going to become. In at number six is Intel 14th gen CPUs. I feel like Intel are a bit in the firing line for this video. Sorry about that. No, the the reason I say this is because, well, there's plenty of problems really. The first is that Intel 14th gen is at the end of the road when it comes to its current LGA 1700 socket. Intel's upcoming 15th gen or whatever they end up calling it, it's codenamed Arrow Lake, is going to be on a brand new socket and a brand new architecture. That means if you buy a current 14th gen motherboard and CPU, you aren't going to have the upgrades that even AMD's Ryzen 7000 is going to offer. Plus there of course have been huge problems with Intel 14th gen on the whole. We identified some of these when we first reviewed it back when it came out. The chips run so hot, they struggled to hit those boost clock speeds as I was mentioning earlier. And fundamentally, for the price, you're better off waiting or picking up a comparable option from AMD. As I say, Ryzen 9000 is only a matter of weeks away at this point, so I'd see what the numbers are like there before buying any high-end CPU right now. In at number seven is a non-Gem4 NVMe drive. Now, much like DDR5, 
R5 memory, there are different generations of SSDs, Gen 3, Gen 4, and Gen 5. In short, Gen 3 is going to give you up to about 3.5 gigabytes per second on the read and the write, Gen 4 is limited to about 7, 7.5, while Gen 5 is going to be more in the 14 to 15 gigabyte per second region. Now, just because these are the speeds that the bus and interface can cope with doesn't mean that the drive you buy will necessarily satisfy them, so ensure you read SSD reviews like ours to see what speeds are achievable. The reason I say this is that Gen 4 NVMe drives are so cheap right now. Crucial's P3 Plus, WD's Black SN770, and a recent drive we looked at from Team Group are all highly affordable options in the Gen 4 bracket. Slow storage can actually be a bottleneck nowadays, especially with how strong high-end GPUs are. The only exception to this really would be if you're looking at picking up a Gen 5 drive, but again, these come with a health warning. This 881 has a fan given how hot the controller runs, and this really ugly cable. This is noisy, not particularly sightly, and as drives in this space get better, won't be needed. Corsair's recent MP700 Pro SE doesn't need a heatsink and runs pretty cool while delivering awesome speeds, so progress is being made on that front. They're just simply very expensive and overkill for most build configurations. In at number 8 is an overpriced CPU cooler. Now I appreciate this advice is pretty broad, but here's what I mean. High-end air coolers are really nice if you want that as an aesthetic piece for your build, but often won't deliver the same performance that a cheaper, larger liquid cooler will do. Similarly, all the time I see people building quite price conscious builds with Ryzen 5 and i5 CPUs and whacking a high-end 360mm AIO in the system when it's just not needed. Now I did talk about cooling earlier and the importance of minimizing thermal throttling. However, spending a lot of money on a CPU cooler can be an inefficient way to divide your budget when that cash can often be used to buy a higher-end CPU instead. PC building is all about balance, right? And there are still valid reasons for spending a bit more than average on your cooler. You might like the way it looks, you might appreciate a screen inside of your build. And while there is no right or wrong way to do it, an overpriced CPU cooler can be a bad way to waste money, especially in those more budget-oriented and mid-range systems. In at number nine is power supplies. Not the most interesting of components, but a really important point now more than ever. And I'm not just gonna tell you guys to go for a power supply from a reputable brand or make sure it's got an 80 plus certification. All of that stuff is obviously important. Instead, I would point you in the direction of ATX3. Now for really budget oriented builds, this is less of a consideration. But for high-end systems where you're using a next gen NVIDIA GPU in particular, or even a high-end AMD card, ATX3 is where I'd go. On the NVIDIA side, you've obviously got the aesthetic advantage of the 16 pin PCI Gen 5 power cable. And it means you haven't got to use the adapter, which is generally a slightly safer bet anyway. But ATX3 isn't just about that new cable. It's also a standard in terms of how the power supply is designed and how much power the unit uses, especially when idling. An ATX3 unit is a really good way to ensure you've got a solid PSU. And in the case of options like Thermaltake Smart BM3750, you haven't got to spend a fortune to buy one either. Talking of spending a fortune, in at number 10, we're going to talk about motherboards and particularly Wi-Fi. Now, I don't want to go too much into the crux of what you should and shouldn't look for in a motherboard, but this dongle right here is your golden ticket. Now, some of you won't need Wi-Fi in your PCs, and equally, I know some of you in the comments are going to be going, James, I can buy a Wi-Fi adapter off Amazon for like $12.99 and it goes in my USB port and it's all groovy. But from my experience, this, if you want Wi-Fi, is always the best way to do it. You haven't got to use up crucial PCI slots or USB ports. You get much better signal and you often get Bluetooth included too. Plus, the cost differential is normally no more than $20 between a Wi-Fi and non-Wi-Fi board. These things are also nice and easy to adjust and the antennas are a universal design. So you can go ahead and pick up any Wi-Fi antenna you like for super strong signal strength. This thing is always going to crap all over a USB device when it comes to signal strength. What do you guys think of these 10 recommendations? Hopefully you find them useful and it gives you some specific product SKUs you should avoid too. If you'd like to see some of my top product recommendations on the flip side, I'll link some of those down below as well as a couple of the things I've mentioned in the video today. If you enjoyed this video, like to learn more about PC building or just have a good time, get subscribed and drop a comment below. Thanks for watching and as always, we'll see you in the next one.